Hey guys, so I've been wanting to do this video on Lion of Judah for a while. And man, this is a big channel. I'm probably going to get some person who comments and says, You're jealous of their subscribers! <laughs> oh man. Yeah, 2.7 million subs, 2.8. Um, there was a guy preaching faith alone on this channel. Do you know that? I hadn't listened to this channel in months because when I used to listen to it, it would scare the life out of me. And so I couldn't listen to it anymore. At first, I thought it was cool. They have really cool thumbnails, angels in the sky, hellfire coming down from above, all this cool stuff. It's, it's, it's incredible CGI effects in their thumbnail. You don't see any of that stuff in the video usually. But yeah, so you start clicking on it. It's, it's like almost like an eye candy type thing. And them and Grace for a Purpose got me. I, I didn't want to be a Christian anymore. I just walked away. And a lot of people may say that's because that's because you don't have what it takes, right? That's that's what the world will say to you. Uh, you don't want to do this job. You don't have what it takes. Yeah, well, Christ gives free, okay? So uh, Christ gives freely to those who come to him, okay? Drink freely of the water of life. You know, that's what you can do. Um, and the world is preaching work salvation. That's what the world is doing. And so is this channel. And they're going to do it under the cloak of faith, Actually, I don't even know if this guy says anything about faith or believing in the first five minutes. But there was one preacher on this channel, and I'm going to post the video. I'm going to try to find it. They got 5,000 videos. I'm going to try to find the video where this guy was on there, and he was saying things like, Your behavior cannot save you. Your good works cannot save you. Only your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ can save you. And he gives eternal life. And no one can snatch you from his hand. I couldn't believe it. I thought the channel took a turn to faith alone or something. I didn't know what was going on. But that was only the first half of that video. The second half, was it was a 20-minute video. The first 10 minutes, this guy just preached faith alone. The second half of the video, it took a turn. I think it was this guy's voice that I'm doing now. Um, and... Yeah, I was beside myself because it, it seemed to have two different Gospels in the same video. Th that guy definitely preached faith alone, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to try the video. I'm gonna, I mean, I'm going to try to find the video and put it in, uh, not in this video because it'll make this video too long. But, okay, so let's get right into it. False Assurance of Heaven. Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. These are the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ as he spoke during the Sermon on the Mount. Here, Jesus was laying down the truth about the kingdom of God and what the requirements are for one to enter the kingdom of heaven. Almost everyone has the hope that they will enter the kingdom of heaven one day. But suppose that the time comes and those who had high hopes of entering the kingdom of God are denied entry and thrown outside. Only those who are born again will enter the kingdom of God. So right here, I don't know if you notice, I think that's a red flag. Uh, I think it's a red flag that he's putting up the verses and he's showing all of them. You know, he's not... Because sometimes they'll only show like 21 and 22. They won't show 23 of Matthew 7. And uh, it's people propping up their works, you know. What, what, what's not being said by these people on Judgment Day to Jesus is, Lord, Lord, didn't we have faith in you? Lord, Lord, didn't I put my trust in you? Lord, Lord, didn't I believe on your name? That's not being said because anyone who does that has done the will of the Father and cannot be denied. But this guy doesn't want to tell you that. He doesn't want to go right to that to give you that assurance that the will of the Father was stated by Jesus in John 6. And so, but if we look at Matthew 7... Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, 
but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And then he goes to John 3, which is how one becomes born again. And then he's going to give his dissertation on what that means and looks like. And uh, whew, it's pretty it's pretty ambiguous. It's pretty hard to place a finger on what he's really trying to say. And you'll see. But let's just go to the Bible. I mean, we don't got to listen to this guy, right? What does this guy know? All I got to do is go to John chapter 6 and read for myself. And it takes a while to put these verses together sometimes because the revelation that we get is all in a different timeline. And so for some it could be years, for some it could be decades, for some it could be shorter than others, you know. But John 6.40 states, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And so people will say, well, there's other wills of the Father. Well, concerning salvation, this is the will of the Father. Uh, I've even had people on Discord tell, oh, you're going to go to John 640 now. You're going to go to John 640, let me guess. Yes, that's exactly what I'm going to do. That's exactly what I'm going to do. You Christ-denying, reprobate-minded fool. Sorry, but that's what you are. If you think that there's more than one will of the Father concerning salvation, then you're going to have to work for it. And that's the law. Go to Matthew 5 through 7. Do it. And then get back to me. Tell me when you've torn out your eye. Tell me when you're perfect like your Father in Heaven is perfect. If He's indeed your Father. So, continuing on here, you're going to hear some rough stuff, but let's see how far we can get before I have to stop it again. Matthew 7 verses 21 to 23 suggests that there will be some people who have a false assurance of salvation. They genuinely believe that they are born again, yet Jesus Christ does not know them. There is a phenomenon in our generation which is called cultural Christianity, where because I attend church on Easter and at Christmas, I am now a Christian, or I was born in a Christian household, and that means I am automatically a Christian. Church attendance does not equate to salvation. The truth is, the bus to hell has a bus stop right outside of church, and that bus is full every week. Salvation will change you. A true encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ will change you. True salvation will make you think twice about living a godless life. It will make you think twice about bed hopping from one bed to another. It will make you think twice about living a life of sin. Yes. We know that no one is perfect, and I myself am not perfect. And there it is. And what's, what's so instantly funny about this is that this is said by so many people. And this just simply boils down to the functionality of the law. And, and I really think that over 95% of the people that have something wrong with their approach to God has to do with the functionality of the law. Okay? I mean, this guy doesn't want you to hear Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believed not. Remember what Jesus said to Thomas. Thomas, you have seen and believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. What does that mean? What does he say in the verse 35 of John 6? And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me, right? All that the Father giveth me shall cometh to me. So he's relating coming to Jesus and believing on him as the same thing. These are interchangeable. If you come to Jesus, you're automatically going to believe on him because that's the Father's will. He's not going to reject you. If you have come to Jesus for your salvation and believed on his name, that he is, he is the Son of God, he came into the world, he suffered, was bruised for your transgressions, killed, buried, and rose on the third day for your justification, if you believe that with your heart, you have become the righteousness of God in Him. Celebrate that every day of your life. 
This channel is not going to give you that. They're not going to give you the bread of life. They're not going to give you the everlasting water that springs up, that's inside you, the Holy Spirit, giving you that, that truth because he doesn't have it. It's my suspicion that he does not have the Holy Spirit because if he's been doing this for 10, 20 years and he's, he's trying to scare you with this video, he's not trying to give you any food and water, and you're not going to get any of that. No spiritual food and drink here. Works, works, works. Self-examination. Sin, 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 sin consciousness. Are you sinning a lot? I mean, I sin too, guys, but I'm not perfect, but I sin less than you. So he has some obedience to the law that's maybe a couple tiers better than you or me, guys. And so that's what's going to get him in there uh, into God's kingdom on Judgment Day, which is so interesting because why wouldn't he come up with this? I mean, we all know the verse. For it is grace ye are saved. For it is by grace ye are saved. Okay? Through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay? So this guy would definitely have something to boast about because his performance under the law is going to be different than everyone's. And so if his is good enough to win him a ticket to heaven, like he's claiming here, then, uh, yeah he's going to have to have a perfect performance under that law. So his claim of not being perfect is uh, going to get him cast out because look what it says about those who take the law up. Because guys, 1 John 3, 4 says that sin is transgression of the law. He who sinneth also transgresses the law for sin is transgression of the law. For as many are under the works of the law are under the curse for it is written. Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. So when this guy does his little I'm not perfect dance, but I, I deny enough sin, all he's saying is he's under the law a transgressor. And it's probably going to be to a much higher volume than he could possibly fathom because in this life right now, he's not under the scrutiny of God at the judgment seat and he has no clue how many times he is failing at the law. Another verse we might want to look at, too, is an interesting verse that I think goes ignored. Um, it's quite an interesting verse because right smack dab here in the middle of this chapter. So it says, Ye are they which justify ourselves or yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. The law and the prophets, you see that? It's everything. It's 613 commandments. It's one unit. It's a single unit of law that's mentioned many times in Romans and um, in the Pauline epistles. Um, and so you're going to see that word come up often and people like to say, well, that's only pertaining to dietary ordinances or Levitical, you know, law. Look, that's complete nonsense. We can see from Galatians 3.10 that that's simply not true. Um, and so let's see where we're at in the video here. All right. So we made it two and a half minutes in. The Bible says in 1 John 1, verse 8, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So, I am not trying to say that born-again Christians do not ever sin. No man or woman is perfect. We all miss the mark. What I am saying is that true salvation will change you. There is a progression that you will see. Too often in this generation, there is a feel-good gospel that tells people, come as you are and stay as you are. But that's not salvation. God requires... Okay, so... All right, let's, let's unpack a few things here. So you notice how he said there, come as you are, but don't stay as you are, something to that effect. I think that's interesting because Colossians 2, 6 says... As ye have therefore received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Guys, we know that Paul constantly taught 
to walk by faith. Okay? We walk by faith, not by sight. Okay? This man in the video is teaching you to walk by sight. He's looking for an external change. Meaning he looks at people's behavior patterns and decides if they're a Christian or not. Okay? And so if we were to use the Pharisees as any kind of barometer for that kind of judgment, this man would call them upright men of God. Okay? Simply put. And we know what Jesus said about the Pharisees. They were dead men walking. Okay? Uh, and I'll, I want to make a comment about Luke 18, too, that comes to mind when I hear this guy talking. But first, let me just tell you. Guys, you're complete in him. Okay? We are complete in Jesus Christ. He began a good work in you. Colossians 1.6 he began that good work the moment you believed. Colossians 1.6 says, Which is come unto you, as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Since the day you heard the gospel. And you know what? We don't produce fruit. Bringeth forth fruit, or bearing fruit, is something that a branch does naturally because of the vine it abides in. Okay? It takes the nutrients in the water from the ground. The vine sucks all that up. It takes in the sunlight. Okay? And the branches bear fruit. Okay? Paul said in Romans 7, 4, that you cannot bear fruit until you die to the law anyway. So, if you have a conceptualization in your mind that you're sinning too much, you're under the law. Okay, the law speaks to those who are under it. It does not speak to those who are not under the law. <laughs> and Paul couldn't have pointed out, uh, you know, enough for us that, well, he, he did actually. What I mean to say is he pointed it out at nauseum that we're not under the law. So we don't need any kind of uh, law conceptualization in our mind to deny ungodliness. Grace does that. It is grace that teaches us to deny ungodliness. Okay, you, knowing you're righteous. Just waking up every day and telling yourself, I am righteous. I have the righteousness of God in me. That position can't change. Okay, so walk that out. Who wants to live a life of sin? Who wants to live a life of constant guilt over sin? And, you know, this guy, the message that he's putting forth, it sounds godly and good. But we know what he's really saying. He's saying that those behavior patterns are dependent upon your salvation. When I say that we shouldn't live a life of sin, it's because we are righteous. So let's practice some righteousness. Why not? I mean, after all, we never feel good when we sin. It may feel good in the moment. Okay, this certain... I think people would be lying if they said there aren't certain things that could feel good in the moment that are sin. But it always leaves you with that empty feeling. It just passes away immediately. It's really not something that we could uh, hang our hat on at the end of the day. And so, but Jesus Christ, we can certainly do that with. Um, and then he, he says, there's definitely going to be this change in you. And there is a change. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This is a spiritual change. Your spirit has been quickened. You have been justified. You have been reconciled. You have been born again. None of these things can be taken away from you. They're not a reversible thing that, you know, uh, being born again is irreversible. You can't reverse being born again. There's no such thing as an unborn Christian. Okay? You can't become born again of God and then unborn of God. That's nowhere in Scripture. Sorry. Sorry. For those who believe that, you're just dead wrong. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I wanted to cover there. He's looking for the outward change, you know. Paul said that we, uh, we now know no man after the flesh, but after the spirit, right? We used to know Jesus Christ after the flesh, and we know him that way no more. So this guy is looking, he's looking at your behavior patterns to judge if you're saved or not. It's really kind of like a John MacArthur type thing. Okay, so let me get back, see where we're at you to come as you are and then once you are born again depart from sin and unrighteousness 
You can't be born again and say there is not one single change in your life before you were saved to after you were saved. The truth is, true salvation will change your habits. It will change your speech. It will change your wants and desires. It will even change the friends you spend time with. Within my years in the ministry, I have watched the lives of people. I have watched people go through different stages of their life. I have watched people start their own families and destroy those same families ten years later. I have. Yeah, so he looks at those people as unsaved reprobates or people that just. They did everything he did in the beginning. I mean, we all know that we have to believe on Jesus Christ to be born again. So if we're all starting at point zero with zero works to show for ourselves and only our sin confession, I'm a sinner, I need a savior, then what is it about these people who do the same thing that this so-called minister does or pastor or whatever position he holds? What did they do differently than you did? Are you saying that they believed in vain? They, you know, because believing in vain is in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 8. It talks about how, how be it that there are some among you that say there is no resurrection of the dead. That's somebody who doesn't believe. That's an unsaved person right there. You can't believe Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead and be saved. That's not possible. So his resurrection symbolizes our rebirth. And so he's basically saying these people that may have been sinning too much and destroyed their family through sin, you know, these, these people are just not saved, you know. And, you know, look what these people are doing. He's, they, they destroyed their family life, so, you know, they, they don't have the Holy Spirit. That's a heavy accusation to lay. You know, two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee. That I am not as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of my earnings. Right? I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So what this guy is saying is a double-talking devil. He's saying to you that he's not perfect and he sins. Yet he's accusing others of sinning too much. So it's just a matter of they're just sinning too much. I sin less than them, so I'm justified. That's what he's saying. Jesus says the opposite here in Luke 18. It looks like he's, he's more fitting the description of the man who claims he's not like other men. And he thanks God for it. Guys, you can't meet Jesus and not start sinning a lot less. I, I met Jesus and I started sinning a lot less. This is my proof of salvation. I've observed people during this period of time. People who have lived lives like hell itself. I mean, they have committed every sin under the sun with no remorse, neither any hesitation. But in their own eyes, they are saved. And if they were to die that very second, they had an assurance that they were going to heaven. These people are literally deceiving themselves. When the Lord Jesus saves you, he changes you. You cannot, you cannot meet the Son of the living God and remain exactly the same. The fruits that your life bear will begin to change. When God saves you, he changes you and transforms the way you live your life. Too many churches allow Christians to live like hell itself and expect to go to heaven. Yeah, you see how this is just going on and on. It's almost impossible. It's almost an insufferable noise in my ear. He said early, you know, earlier, and I wanted to mention, he said too many people go to church and they hear this good news gospel uh, or this, this feel-good gospel. That actually was like a Freudian slip because the gospel is good news. But d d didn't you hear what he said earlier? He had said, I don't want to try to find it now because I'll go all off and I'll probably miss it. <laughs> but he, he did say something like, too many churches today have this feel-good gospel. Yes, yes, that's right. The gospel does feel good. And, and I would actually say that it's the opposite. I would say a lot of churches today preach repenio sins to be saved. Okay? from Mr. Pastor so-and-so. A lot of them preach this 
works uh, based salvation, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, I mean, come on, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the LDS, Jehovah Witnesses, these are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of believers, so quote unquote believers, that say it's faith plus works. And they all have different renderings of what that looks like, too. Just like this guy. These people haven't changed enough. They haven't changed their life like me. As if an atheist can't stop being a drug addict or a fornicator or an adulterer. Okay? I mean, this guy's not understanding the spiritual rebirth. And that the reason why Paul had to give so many admonishments and beseechings and exhortations in his epistles is because that behavior didn't just happen by itself. Why would he tell people to put on the new man? Walk after the spirit that you not fulfill the deeds of the flesh. Why would he tell people to do those things if they were going to automatically happen? I mean, let's, let's take, for example, the Corinthians. This guy would 100% write his epistle to them and tell them, you're all a bunch of unsaved bastards. Your, your lives haven't changed enough. This guy's fornicating. This guy's suing his brother. He's taking him to Gentile courts to resolve matters. I mean, he would just do a number on them. And he would cause fear and panic. And, th and that's what he's doing here. He's causing fear and panic. Has my life changed enough? First, he says it's one change. Then he says it's a dramatic change, you know. The Lord's going to change you. It's going to be a complete transformation. And you know what? In my opinion, I think all of us have had that transformation. In the sense that we recognize that we have the righteousness of God in us. Okay, and that apart from any works we do and behavior patterns that we change, we already have that because we have the testimony and the record of God's Son so that we know that we are now the sons of God, as First John will tell us. I write these things unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. This man's telling you that you can only know by some unquantifiable behavioral change. This is utterly ridiculous. Uh, I would have you guys even consider this passage, which I read a lot, and I'm really trying to wonder what Jesus really meant by this. Look what Jesus says here, because this guy wants to say that, hey, you guys are going to have this wicked change and everyone's going to see it on you. Well, he says here, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Clear distinction there. Remember, Jesus also said in John 6 that the flesh shall profit you nothing. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Remember, this is a Pharisee, guys. This is Nicodemus. This is a master of Israel. This guy's behavior was second to none. This guy's behavior would put this guy to an open shame. This guy in the video would get ran circles around by Nicodemus. Nicodemus would look like a saint compared to this guy. Okay, look at look what Nicodemus is saying. Or look what Jesus is saying about him. Uh, where does he say it? He says, Aren't thou a master of Israel and not knowest these things? Ah, verse 10. Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? So that... That goes to show you where behavior will get you. Make no mistake about it, man. This guy, Nicodemus, was probably a top Pharisee. Probably like Paul. Under the law, blameless, right? Um, and so he says, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. What, what does it sound like Jesus is trying to say there? That the people of the Spirit, you don't know where they're coming from or where they're going. Someone could be born again. You, you can't just tell by looking at their flesh. You can't just say, oh, this guy's behavioral patterns aren't up to par. Man, that stuff pisses me off. Sorry, okay, let's go. Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23 tells us that there were a group of people who are in for a rude awakening. Don't let anyone tell you that God allows you to live any way you want. That is a lie, and you are deceiving yourself. You do know a person can deceive themselves straight to hell. 
Salvation will change, and salvation can be seen by the way you live. Come as you are, and stay as you are, is deception that leads people to hell. God indeed wants you to come as you are, in your mess, in your sin, with a past full of mistakes and sin. God wants you to come as you are, but once you come to Him and yield your life to Him and submit your life to Him, God will begin to change you, and He will begin to direct you to the things He expects of you. Hebrews 12 verse 14 Pursue peace with everyone, as well as holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Are you guys cringing yet? Forgive me because I'm, I'm hearing it all and I'm trying to let the video play for a little bit, but he's saying so much insanity. He, he's saying that God will change you, but no one knows what that outwardly change looks like. Okay, that's why we're born of the Spirit and the Spirit is quickened. That happens immediately upon faith. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, I would ask you to reference that. Um, and you guys know those verses, I'm pretty sure. The reason why I want to continue on... Oh, I'll post them up on the... Uh, and when I edit. But, guys, look. We're all starting at zero, right? We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. After we believe, we get sealed with the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit is sealed with you to the day of redemption. You cannot break that seal. You cannot do something in your flesh to break that seal. That's not how spiritual rebirth works. This guy has no clue what he's talking about. I'm just telling you that right now. He has absolutely no clue what he's talking about. And I would have to make the assumption that this guy is totally unsaved and speaking from a carnal mind and just has no clue because the kingdom of God, the mysteries of there in have been hidden from him. Okay. I want you to take a look at an interesting verse. And I think it speaks to this guy's mannerisms. At that time, this is verse 25, Matthew 11. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. This guy's a pastor, right? Or a minister of some sort. And, you know, he probably leads other Christians. And, you know, could you imagine what kind of condemnation these people are under? constantly looking to themselves, constantly not looking at the finished redemptive work of Jesus Christ. They're not looking anywhere near there. For what say the scripture as pertaining to the flesh hath found? If Abraham were justified by works, he would have wear up to glory, but not before God. Romans 1 and 2, Romans 3, uh, sorry, Romans 4, 3. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward, not reckoned of grace, but reckoned of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay, what Jesus did not say, he who believeth on me and has a totally changed life and does a lot of good works and his behavioral patterns are really good and, every, and the eyes of men look upon him and say, this is a born again Christian, may have eternal life. No, he does not say that. He doesn't say anything remotely close to that. In fact, let me show you something interesting. I wonder what our friend in the video would say about this. Uh, so it says in Matthew 21, 31, and he talks about people who didn't do the will of the Father. We know what the will of the Father is, right? Uh, but it goes on to say something very interesting here. They say unto him, the first, Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. Okay, so remember, these are Jews under the law. Their repentance is to turn from the law of Moses and to turn to Jesus Christ. Here, Jesus is making a clear-cut representation that it is a repentance of faith towards God that will save you, not your good behavior. 
He's literally saying here that publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. You with your great behavioral patterns and your great works and your so-called uprightness. Man, I, I just can't get over it. What he said was the implications of it. So heavy. I'm going to try to play a little more of this, but I'm trying to remember some of the other things he had said there in that it was so much. I want to just go back a little bit here. Expect you to the things he expects of you. Hebrews 12, verse 14. Ah. Pursue peace with everyone, as well as holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. So guys, from listening to what he's been saying all this time, we clearly know that this guy is looking to attain a holiness of his own, his own righteousness. That's very evident to me now that he's looking for a righteousness of his own. Guys, we don't need anything but the scriptures. We don't need this guy's garbage. We don't need this guilt trip about how your life is looking. We have a perfect relationship with the Father through the Son. Romans 5.1 will tell you, we now have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the faith in Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10.10, by the which will? Whose will is it, guys? By the which will? That's the Father's will. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. You cannot be sanctifying yourself. You cannot be earning sanctification. Spiritual gifts, guys. Hebrews 10.14, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. You're perfected forever. Everlasting perfection in the Lord Jesus Christ is what we have. Our sins have been blotted away as far as the east is from the west. Christ has forgiven us all trespasses, Colossians 2.13. Are you hearing any of that from this guy? I'm not hearing that. I'm hearing a lot of condemnation, a lot of doubt and worry that I should have. I'd be fearful that my behavior wasn't good enough. But I know that I cannot be saved by my works. Let's see if we can get through some more of this. This is what salvation does. Salvation will make you pursue different things that you used to. Before salvation, you may have pursued money. Before salvation, you may have pursued illicit sex. Before salvation, you may have pursued pleasure. The publicans and the harlots. Before salvation, you may have pursued relationships with people. But true salvation will make you pursue holiness. This yeah. yeah, guys, so if you pursue a relationship with someone, forget it. You're just not safe. What is this guy saying? I, I, I'm going on long enough here. I, I'm trying to figure a way to wrap this up, but I'm still kind of reeling from what this guy is saying. I, I don't know anything about what it takes to get saved from his the first six minutes of this video. Um, I don't think there's a point in listening to anything else because this guy has just revealed himself as a wolf. There are many false prophets in the world even now. And that was 2,000 years ago, right? So, you know, guys, you can't pursue a relationship. You can't make money. Guys, guys, are you trying to make money to feed your families? Well, you better pursue holiness. You don't have the righteousness of God in you. You have to work for that. That's what this guy's telling you. So, guys, you know, I hope this blesses someone. I really wanted to do a video on this channel. And it's amazing that they got like 5,000 videos a bunch of them between 10 and 20 minutes long, and I can't even get through 10 minutes of this uh, without doing a 40 minute video. Uh, so I can't go on any longer. Uh, maybe I'll, what I'll do is I'll do a part two with another one of their videos. and I'll try to find that video where the guy was preaching faith alone from this channel. And when you hear it, you're going you're gonna to hear the gospel. But anyway, uh, God bless you guys, and I will talk to you soon. Take care.